Hi dear students, a warm good morning to all of you and welcome to this new topic of immunology. What is immunology basically? When we come across our daily life, uh, we do find different exposures to different antigens, different pathogens and uh, they could be sometimes bacteria, they could be viruses, they could be fungi and many more like that. And our body always fight against these pathogens, uh, trying to kill them, trying to prevent their multiplication within our body and trying to overcome the ill effects which are being caused by it. In a whole, we would try to resist infection by producing certain responses within our body. And immunology is a science focused on the, those immune responses which is being elicited in our body against the foreign substances in order to resist infection. Immunology can also be distinguished as a science which would help us to uh, distinguish between a self and a non-self. That is, when something which is not of our body enters into our body, we try to throw it away. And the science of that is immunology. And various factors like you have biological, chemical, physiological, metabolic and physical aspects uh, do contribute towards the immune response. So, if you go to consider a uh, immune system, it is mainly like uh, you have your country and you try to prevent uh, the entry of uh, entry of enemies into our nation. So, we have different defense systems like we have the army, navy and the air force which will simultaneously work and try to protect your country from invaders. Similarly, when you go to consider a human body, a human body also does have lots of ways by which we prevent the entry of pathogens and which we fight against the pathogens. They could be biological, chemical factors, physiological factors, metabolical factors and sometimes even the physical factors. And the study of immunology mainly encompasses all these aspects of human immune response specifically when as we are talking about humans and we are learning about that. So the immunity if you consider there are mainly two types of immunity. The first one what we have is the inborn or the innate immunity. The immunity which we get uh, inborn by our birth itself is referred to as the innate immunity. Whereas sometimes during a uh, time of growth or during our lifespan, we happen to uh, get encountered with large amount of pathogens. And each time we get exposed to a pathogen, uh, our body tries to get uh, immunity against it for a lifelong or for even for a short period of time. So, such immunity which we get during our life, during the course of our lifespan is referred to as the acquired or the adaptive immunity. The main difference between the innate and the acquired immunity is that uh, innate immunity is being found to be non-specific in nature. That is, you do not need uh, any specific uh, antigen to be present or the immunity which you develop in an innate immunity is being found to be non-specific. That is, it is not targeting one particular pathogen alone, but it is meant for all the pathogens irrespective of the type which comes. So, you, in the case of innate immunity, it has been found to be non-specific. But the acquired immunity has been found to be specific in nature. That is, if I get an immunity against uh, a particular pathogen, for example, Staphylococcus aureus strain, the immunity against that is only against Staphylococcus aureus. But if I get another pathogen or uh, like Klebsiella pneumonia, the immunity against Staphylococcus aureus will not help me to fight against uh, the next pathogen which is coming. So, in the case of acquired immunity, it has been found to be highly specific. And uh, we also maintain a memory of those, uh, memory of the 
what? Of acquired immunity. But in the case of innate immunity, it has been found to be non-specific and no memory-based uh, storing of uh, information about prior exposures of against the pathogen does exist in the case of innate or the non-specific immunity. If you go to consider the innate immunity, uh, there are different factors which are responsible for it. You can have cellular factors, physical factors and uh, chemical mediators could also be present. And uh, cellular factors could be including different types of cells like we have in the blood, we have granulocytes, you have macrophages, the granulocytes, mainly the neutrophils, basophils, isnophils and all that, they are the granulocytes. And uh, you can have macrophages, dendritic cells and NK cells which are all take parting, which are all playing a role in the innate immunity. Then coming to the physical barriers, uh, we have the skin, mucous membranes, etc. There are many factors, but just some of them have been mentioned over here. And if you're going to consider the chemical factors, which are mainly included, uh, they mainly include enzymes like lysozyme, the complement system, uh, as well as various proteins called the defensins and all that. So all these components of the innate system could either result in the formation of either inflammation or sometimes some resident responses would be there or obsonization is there or cell cooperation would be there. Now what is obsonization? We will be going in details of it. Obsonization is a process of increased phagocytosis so that the microbes are being killed. Now in the case of acquired and the specific immunity, it will help. Uh, it is mainly uh, you can see that the cellular factors are mainly involved in it. That is, the B cells as well as the T cells are mainly being involved in the acquired or the specific immunity. And it also maintains a memory of a antigen exposure. And you can see that a distinction between self and non-self is being uh, obtained by the acquired or the specific or the adaptive type of immunities. So these are the different uh, types of immun immunity that we have basically, the innate immunity as well as the acquired immunity. Now the innate immunity as well as the adaptive immunity, sometimes you can have the adaptive immunity or the acquired immunity by natural methods or by artificial methods also. And among the natural methods, sometimes uh, you will have an active exposure to the uh, antigen, that is when an infection is happening, or sometimes you might get it passively where uh, from the mother, the immunity is being passed over to the, to the baby or the fetus. And sometimes you might get, you might acquire or you get an adaptive immunity by artificial means, by active immunization or by passive immunization where antibody transfer is being done. So this is a, just a basic outline of the different types of immunities. We will be going into the details of it uh, further on. So the innate immunity uh, is the immunity present from the birth or it which has been inbuilt and it acts mainly as a first line of defense to particular microorganisms and it is not been found to be specific in nature. And you can see that uh, sometimes pathogen associated uh, molecular patterns have been also being used as for uh, innate immunity. And you can see even on next exposure or the second exposure to the same antigen, uh, there would be no enhanced immune response. That is because there is no memory that uh, of the innate immunity mechanism. That is, lymphocytes are not being involved, uh, no memory cells are being involved over here, okay. And as a result, even on second exposure, what happens, the level of immunity uh, will be the same. And uh, you can see both cellular as well as humoral components are being involved in the body fluids and it is a rapid response and it cooperates with and directs the adaptive immunity also. And uh, we can see that various components such as the skin, mucous membrane as well as phagocytic cells might be involved in the innate immunity.
If you go to summarize the mechanism of innate immunity, it can be contributed by various factors, either by anatomical barriers or physiochemical barriers or by various processes such as the phagocytic barriers or phagocytosis as well as by inflammatory barriers or by inflammation. Now, among the anatomical barriers, the first and the primest uh, one or the most important one among that is the skin. And the skin in fact acts as a mechanical barrier retarding the entry of the microbes and uh, it also has a temperature of about 3, uh, sorry, a pH of about uh, 3 to 5 which will retard the growth of microorganisms. And uh, further, you can see that various other anatomical barriers such as the mucous membranes are also there, which uh, is mainly been found in the linings of the gastrointestinal tract as well as in the respiratory tract also, you can find certain mucous membranes. These mucous membranes uh, prevent the entry of uh, foreign microorganisms and attached to this mucus, sometimes there would be some cilia which would uh, propel the microorganisms out of the body. And also, the normal microflora which has been associated with the mucous membrane will compete with the other my pathogenic microbes for attachment and for attachment to the sites as well as for nutrients. So let's talk about the skin in detail. So among the physical barriers, the first and the primest is the skin and it mainly consists of three layers, the epidermis, dermis and the hypodermis. And you can see that the epidermis, in the epidermis, it mainly consists of thickly packed cells of, uh, it will be mainly dead cells. Okay, and these dead cells is mainly being filled with a waterproofing protein called the keratin. And this prevents the entry of the microbes. And the down laying dermis, okay, it is composed of connective tissue and various blood vessels, hair follicles, uh, sebaceous glands, and sweat glands, and all that. And this sebum, which has been produced by sebaceous glands, uh, is an oily secretion. And it contains various components of uh, such as the lactic acid as well as fatty acids which helps to maintain the pH of the skin to about 3 to 5. And this pH has been normally been inhibitory to most of the microorganisms. And uh, as we had mentioned earlier, the mucous membranes which have been found uh, lining the nose, mouth, lungs and the urinary tract. And uh, they mainly create a non-specific barrier against the potential pathogens and mucous membranes they mainly consist of a layer of epithelial cells bound by tight junctions and these epithelial cells are the ones which produce the moist sticky substance called the mucus and it covers and protects the more fragile cell layers beneath it and traps the debris and particulate matter including microbes. And if you go to closely analyze mucus, you can see that it also does contain various antimicrobial peptides, which could be inhibitory towards the microbes. And some cilia, okay, you can see this sometimes attached to the uh, cilia, sorry, attached to the mucous membrane, there would be some cilia which will wipe away the microbes and the dust along with the mucus. So the physical barriers of the skin and the mucus does protect, uh, protect the body from non-specific microbial infection. These are the physical barriers which we have. Now we have the intestinal tract uh, where the mucus is mainly being produced by the goblet cells and in the, in the st stomach as well as in the uh, adjoining region, what happens? The mucus mixes with the material received from the stomach and trapping the foodborne microbes and the debris. And the mechanical action of the peristalsis, uh, which mainly involves a muscular contraction in the digestive tract, moves the sloughed mucus and other material through the intestines, rectum and the anus, excreting the material in the fecus. So the mucus is trapping the microbe and the peristaltic movement will enable the trapped microbe to be uh, removed out from the digestive tract 
through the intestine, rectum and the anal outside the body of the organism or of an individual. Now, this mucous membrane could also be present in the respiratory tract where it is called the ciliated epithelial cells and uh, you can see that uh, the movement of the cilia propels the debris laden mucus out and away from the lungs and the expelled mucus is then swallowed or destroyed in the stomach or coughed up and sneezed out and this system of removal is referred to as a mucociliary escalator. Coming to the other physical factors, barriers, you can also consider the eyelashes or the eyelids which uh, prevent the entry of microbes into the eyes and you can see that uh, the flushing action of uh, tears could also prevent the entry of microbes or the removal of microbes from the body. Similar to the eyelids, we also do have a flushing action uh, do happening in the urinary tract which mainly includes the kidneys, ureters and in the urinary bladder. So when urine is being passed out of the body, it removes also all those transient microorganisms or the resident microorganisms preventing, preventing them from getting uh, staying there for a longer time. So when you frequently urinate, uh, the urine also do carries the microbes which could happen to grow in that particular environment in the what? In the kidney, uh, ureter and all that. So these are some physical barriers which we have to which comes under the innate immunity. Now we would be continuing with the physiological barriers in the next session. Thank you for now. Welcome back dear students. In this session we will be continuing with the physiological barriers which play an important role in the innate immune system or the non-specific or the inborn immune system which we have. And among the physiological barriers which we have, the most important among them mainly includes the temperature as well as the low pH which has been uh, observed. Now, how does temperature involve? We can see that normally our body has a normal temperature of 37 degrees centigrade and this inhibits the growth of some of the pathogens. And if the pathogens... Uh, happen to enter into our body, our body responds through it by increasing the temperature of our body so that the growth of the pathogen is being inhibited within our body. And this immune response involving an increase in temperature of the body to inhibit the growth of pathogens is a commonly called fever which we come across quite often. And we can see that other than the temperature, a low pH is being found to be inhibitory to the ingested microorganisms. So within our stomach, what we do is the, an acidity is being maintained within the stomach and this acidity, a low pH or a low pH of about uh, 1 to 3 is being maintained within the stomach so that all those microorganisms which we eat and happen to get ingested into our body through the eating process will be killed when it reaches the stomach. So that's about the physiological barriers, the temperature and the pH. In addition to the temperature and the low pH which we come across oftenly, you can see that various chemical mediators also do play an important role in the innate immune system. And uh, we would be dealing with that right now. Among the biochemical factors, we do know in the sebaceous glands, we do have a oily secretion called the sebum, which has been secreted. And it has been found to be acidic in nature, which helps to maintain the pH around 3 to 5. And the sebaceous glands have been mainly been associated with the skin. And in the skin itself, there are certain regions uh, such as below your below your feet and all that, okay, the soles of your feet specifically speaking, they are being found to contain no sebaceous glands and they appear to be as alkaline gaps where microbial infection is being easily possible. So the sebum 
which by its acidic nature prevents the growth of uh, microorganisms. The second biochemical factor which we can come across is in the tears as we had already mentioned. It contains an enzyme called the lysozyme or the N-acetylmuramidase which will act against the gram-positive bacterial cell wall. And so the lysis of the bacteria can be carried out by the lysozyme. And here we go down to the gastric juice as we had mentioned earlier. The pH is around 1.2. To three, and the gastric juice uh, has it's, it's it's a mixture of in fact HCl, pepsin, and uh, mucus, and various other digestive enzymes. And these enzymes, uh, proteolytic enzymes, proteolytic enzymes are also being present. And mainly, all of these will destroy the bacteria as well as the toxins uh, at a pH of about 1.2 to three. But some of the bacteria uh, could also withstand acidic environment. Now, for example, we have the Helicobacterium pylori. And you can see that even the toxin of uh, Clostridium botulinum is not being uh, destroyed by a pH of about 1.2 to 3. If you go to look out to your blood, in the, within the blood also, we do have a protein called the transferrin. And that has been found to be as... Uh, antibacterial in nature. The next biological fluid which we have is the secretion of from the mammary glands the human milk and you can see that it contains uh, lactoferritin and muraminic acid which is also been found to be antibacterial. And among the human milk itself the first milk of a, uh, of an, uh, of a mother first milk which a baby could get from the mother called the colostrum it does contain large amount of antibodies which is uh, which which could help the baby to overcome infections now saliva and the nasal secretions they also contain mucopolysaccharides which could inactivate the viruses and if you go to look into your blood again you can see that uh, you have certain molecules such as the interferons okay and what are these interferons they are in fact a group of signaling proteins uh, released by the host cells in response to the presence of several viruses now if a cell gets infected by a virus what happens the interferons will be the level of the interferons will be increased or will be more of interferons will be released from that cell and so the nearby cells will uh, the what what they will get an alarm and they will increase the antiviral defense in their body so if i go to talk about uh, you will be learning in detail but i'm just giving you an outline of uh, what is this interferons uh, they mainly refers to a large group of proteins called the cytokines and uh, they help in the communication between the cells to trigger the protective defenses of the immune system and they mainly help to eradicate the pathogens specifically speaking the virus infections and it also has lots of other function that is they activate the uh, immune cells the nk cells and the macrophages these are all cells which have been involved in the innate immune system and uh, the host defense has been upregulated by the production of interferons these are basically proteins which will act as signals which will say that okay some a virus has come so uh, the body will become prepared or the adjoining cells will become prepared uh, to combat the virus and you can see that certain symptoms of infection such as fever muscle pain and flu like symptoms they are mainly being caused by the production of interferons and various other cytokines Let's continue with the physiological factors, specifically the biochemical ones. The next we have the propodin system. The propodin system, it uh, mainly activates the complement mediated obsonization of targeted cells and particles for immune clearance. And it is mainly found in the serum. Uh, and you can see that along with Mg2+, it causes the lysis of the bacteria and inactivates viruses.
So you might think, what is properdin? Before properdin, uh, I forgot to tell you, you need to talk about complements. A complement is a set of proteins which would be increased within a body when an infection happens. Now, when an infection happens, what happens? Or when a pathogen enters, our body will produce certain antibodies. And as a result, antigen-antibody complexes will be formed. And these antigen-antibody complexes uh, has to be killed by the various cellular factors. And once an antigen-antibody complex has been formed, the a complement system or the proteins the comp involved in these complements will bind onto the antigen-antibody complex and it will attract the what? phagocytic cells to do phagocytosis or to kill the antigen antibody complex which has been formed. So, uh, these are basically proteins which have been activated in a cascade fashion. Okay, that is one after the other. Many proteins are mainly been involved in it. I am not going to the full details of it because we have a separate session where we will be dealing with the complement system. So, the main, the end result of the complement activation is uh, the stimulation of phagocytes in order to clear the foreign as well as the damaged material and inflammation uh, to attract the additional phagocytes and the activation of the cell killing membrane attack complex. So, once the comp antigen antibody complex has been formed, the complement system gets activated and uh, the lysis of they come and attach to the antigen antibody complex and the lysis of the antigen antibody complex does happen within the body. And uh, the proportin system which we uh, mentioned earlier, it is a complement mediated. It, it in fact, it uh, activates the complement mediated obsonization of the targeted cells okay so if the uh, to, uh, it's like adding oil into the fire if complement system is considered to be as the fire the properdin will be considered to be as a oil that is something which will increase the complement mediated uh, the effect which has been caused by the complement mediated obsonization. Let's go, I'm not going to details as I mentioned earlier. And various other physiological factors which we have is the acute phase proteins. These are a class of proteins whose plasma concentrations increases uh, in some case and sometimes it would also be decreased in response to inflammation. That is when an infection happens, sometimes some proteins will be increased. They are mainly considered to as a positive acute phase proteins and sometimes some proteins will be decreased within our plasma. They are referred to as a negative acute phase proteins and the response uh, is called the acute phase reaction or the acute phase response and it characteristically involves fever, acceleration of peripheral leukocytes, circulating neutrophils and their precursors. And as a result, what happens uh, when these acute phase proteins increases, what happens? Uh, they are mainly been produced by the liver cells, okay? And uh, when they produce these acute phase proteins, it will increase the rate of like during the process of inflammation, uh, this will help the other cells like neutrophils, granulocytes and macrophages and all. Uh, they would also come there and uh, phagocytosis and sorry phagocytosis and inflammation would be resulted as a result of it. So these are some of the physiological among the physiological factors some of the factors which are main, mainly been responsible for the innate immune system. Uh, in addition to that you can see that various micro resident microorganisms or the normal microflora of the micro of the body as well as the secretions of these microbes could prevent the entry of the pathogens. Now, in the case of vagina, the members of the resident microbiota, they will compete with the opportunistic pathogens like yeast, candida, and will prevent the, inhibit the growth of candida within the vaginal region. Now, this could be either due to the presence of uh, some of the secretions also, which has been done by the microorganisms. Now, in the case of skin bacteria, you can see that they mainly produce bacteriosins and acids, which will inhibit the growth of various other pathogens. And in the gut bacteria, they mainly produce colicins as well as acids, 
which will inhibit the growth of uh, of other pathogens so microbiome as well as their secretions also do play an important role in the uh, as physiological factors in the innate immune system now in the next session we will be continuing with the cellular factors of the innate immune system thank you for now